Hello, welcome to the lecture on isolation detection in my battery management systems course. This topic will be rolled into the BMS functions lecture in some future revision. Thank you for joining me in the transition to sustainable energy. In my original lecture on BMS functions, I presented this diagram. Some battery systems incorporate one more function, isolation detection. In a low voltage system, such as an electric skateboard, we might have a single battery switch. The battery ground and the system ground are separated only by a very small value resistor, that being the shunt. The battery ground and the system grounds are strongly connected and perhaps only tens of millivolts apart. In a high voltage system, such as an electric car, we should expect two battery switches, which can completely disconnect the battery from the rest of the vehicle. This also means that the battery ground is separate from the chassis ground. Indeed, any communications between the two will go through an intentional isolation of some sort, typically capacitors or inductors. When the switches are open then, the negative battery terminal is connected only to very local circuits, mainly the battery management system. The chassis ground is entirely separate. The chassis ground is all over the car. Chassis ground is the ground for the main vehicle computer, the infotainment, headlights, windshield wipers, windows, and indeed is typically connected to the frame of the vehicle. Why bother? Isolation requires substantial overhead. We need that second high voltage current switch. We need isolated communications for any communications crossing the isolation barrier, usually implemented as capacitors or transformers, and we need a secondary power source, such as a 12-volt battery, to power the various vehicle systems when the battery switches are open. It's all about safety. Let's talk about what fault we're worried about. We're worried about a fault where some node inside our high-voltage battery shorts to something in the rest of the system. In particular, since chassis ground is so much everywhere, let's consider a short to the vehicle chassis. For the sake of example, let's label some voltages. Start with a battery ground, calling that zero volts. And let's assume a 400 volt battery. Imagine that the fault connects the middle of the battery at 200 volts to the chassis. That means our vehicle chassis is now at 200 volts relative to the bottom of the battery. At this point, we don't have a problem yet. Maybe the 12 volt systems are powered by 212 volts with a 200 volt local ground, but we don't have a problem yet. Consider what happens when the contactors close. Do you see any bad thing happening? When the contactors close, nothing much happens. We have a fault, but functionally, the system is still working just fine. The fault can persist silently. Here's the problem. Say a mechanic goes to work on the lower switch, or the shunt, or a bus bar on the negative battery terminal. That seems like a fairly safe thing to do, right? We're talking ground, an isolated ground even. And say they inadvertently brush their tool against the omnipresent chassis ground. We have 200 volts across that tool, 200 volts across a low impedance source, you might just see the max current that the battery can put out. A lot of power, not safe, likely to cause collateral damage. Worse, let's imagine the tool only touches battery ground, but the mechanic holding the tool brushes against the vehicle frame. We now have 200 volts across the mechanic. That's not a human safe voltage. We need high voltage battery systems to be serviceable. At the very least, they need to be manufacturable. Good isolation of the battery reduces the prevalence of dangerous situations. We want high voltage points to be very clear and easy to avoid. Putting chassis at high voltage increases the area of the dangerous high voltage to a possibly intractable problem. Here's a second problem, this one possible when contactors are closed and the system is running. Motors are noisy. And inverters, as you might see in a high voltage stationary energy storage system, have very similar architectures. Both consist of big switches controlling current through inductors, 
whether those inductors are motor windings or components in a DC-DC converter or DC-AC converter. We can expect noise on the high voltage bus and proportionately smaller ripple in the middle of the battery. But if the middle of our battery is shorted to chassis ground, that noise is now on our chassis ground. A ground that we expected to be polluted only by the switching of digital circuits like the vehicle computer is now polluted by the much higher power switching of the motor. Noise like this can disrupt digital communication signals and cause errors in analog measurements, resulting in glitches or erratic behavior. So how do we measure isolation between two electrical nodes to detect an isolation fault? A first guess might be that we measure the voltage between the two grounds. But this isn't enough. If the systems are fully isolated, the difference between their potentials is undefined. You can measure anything. You might measure 0 volts, or 1 volt, or 100 volts. In practice, the difference between two well-isolated grounds may be a function of a somewhat fixed parasitic, in which case it may be somewhat predictable yet also variable from one unit to another. Building on that idea, we might intentionally define the voltage difference. Perhaps we place a large value resistor between the two grounds. Then, when all is well with intact isolation, we measure zero volts between grounds. In the case of the fault from our example putting 200 volts on chassis ground, the voltage measurement constituting our isolation diagnostic measures 200 volts. A challenge to keep in mind is that the resistances this big are similar to the expected parasitic resistance between traces on a normal PCB. One must be cautious with the implementation. And we don't want a low resistance since first the goal is isolation, so our resistor needs to approximate an open much more than a short. And secondly, we don't want ground noise to result in significant current flow and self-heating in this resistor. A caveat of this solution is that it won't detect a short between the two grounds. Another idea is to perturb the voltage difference and confirm that it changes as expected. We might implement switches with a resistor in series, the resistor being there to limit current flow. When we close a switch, we expect to measure the applied voltage across the two grounds. If all is well and we close switch A, we measure zero volts. When we open switch A and close switch B, the measured voltage changes to 3.3 volts. In case of an isolation fault, at least one of the readings differs from the expected. In case of our example fault, with a hard short between chassis ground and the halfway point of the battery, regardless of which switch is closed, we will measure 200 volts. The simple example of applying two readily available voltages is just a specific implementation of a more general case. More generally, we apply some perturbance with either a current or a voltage source. It may be DC or it may be AC. And then we measure whether our perturbance produces the expected result. We need at least two data points so if the undefined voltage difference between properly isolated grounds coincidentally matches our stimulus, we have a second data point to give us full confidence. Let's summarize what we learned so far. Isolation detection is a safety function. As such, it is important in high voltage systems and may be unnecessary in low voltage systems. Without isolation detection, a short between the battery domain and the system ground domain may not detectably affect system behavior. An isolation detection circuit fundamentally perturbs the system to a known state and then measures to confirm the expected known state. Next, we'll talk about some nuances. If we dig deeper, the voltage between battery ground and chassis ground often has a deterministic root source. In practice, it often is defined by large parasitic capacitances. In a car, these are large enough that we may be able to point at them directly. In particular, the capacitance between the battery and its case is significant. Every cell has some capacitance to the battery case. If you think about how large that battery case is, you can imagine that the total of all these capacitances adds up to something substantial.
That large battery case also has a capacitance to the vehicle frame or chassis. This capacitive divider can determine where battery ground is relative to chassis ground. The capacitance between the motor windings and the motor case also is significant. Relying on parasitics to determine important behaviors is a little scary. Parasitic values can differ from unit to unit, from manufacturing run to manufacturing run, and over time in a single device. Let's go back to that idea of putting an explicit resistor between the grounds. This intentionally sets the voltage between grounds. This is actually pretty important. It makes the system more robust to electrostatic buildup and other parasitic voltage disturbances. In a 400 volt system, you would expect at least 400 volt isolation. Static electricity can cause arbitrarily large voltages to develop, possibly in excess of what the isolation can withstand. A large value resistor provides a path to dissipate electrostatic buildup. Next, let's consider how system capacitance affects our isolation detection diagnostic. We have our parasitic capacitances between the battery and battery case, and also between the battery case and the vehicle chassis. Consider how that capacitance affects our simplest isolation detection circuit. With no capacitance, the moment the switch closes, the measured voltage changes, instantaneous. With capacitance, however, the response is slower. The resistance of the switch and the magnitude of the capacitance set some RC time constant. It takes time to charge up that parasitic capacitance. We need to ensure that the diagnostic voltage measurement occurs with enough delay to properly assess the signal. This includes designing the stimulus source to provide a large enough current to charge these capacitances within the diagnostic time interval. Note also that a strong stimulus means a strong electrical connection, or in other words, the isolation monitoring circuit breaks isolation during the diagnostic measurement. Significant parasitic capacitances are scary. They affect system behavior, but because they are parasitic, the behavior may vary unpredictably. Another remedy is to override these parasitic capacitances by installing larger, intentionally chosen capacitances. In a vehicle, these are referred to as Y caps and X caps. The X cap is installed line to line, which in this system means between the high voltage positive and negative. The Y cap is installed line to ground, which in this system means between the two grounds. A key point here is that these intentionally designed capacitors should dominate over the parasitic capacitors. Let's summarize some key ideas. Parasitic capacitances can determine the voltage between battery and chassis ground. This is scary because parasitics vary unpredictably. A resistor between battery ground and chassis ground will set the DC point and also dissipate electrostatic charge accumulation. The large capacitances in a system like an electric vehicle affect the timing of the isolation detection diagnostic. Explicitly designed capacitors can set predictable known behavior. They are known as X caps and Y caps. Also, they help filter system noise. This completes the lecture on isolation detection in my battery management systems course. If you liked what you saw, please help this course get seen. Share it with a colleague, share it with a customer, share it with a favorite college professor. And of course, subscribe, like, and comment.